Let's breathe life into this Frankenstein rocking chair. This is a kid-sized rocking chair that my mom gifted to us years ago in the hope that it would be used again someday by our grandkids. My oldest daughter loved to sit in it at Grandma's house, and it just collected dust up in the attic until our daughter had a daughter of her own. Now, looking at it closely for the first time, it turns out to be a bit of a horror show. I hope that it might have been a family heirloom, but I think my mom maybe got this from a flea market, not noticing that it was a Frankenstein chair made up of mismatched bits and pieces. There are crappy repairs all over this chair, starting with this maple patch job on the oak seat back. It also sticks out too far to the left. On the right side, it looks like a circular saw had blasted through the top, patched badly with some lighter wood. The chair seems to be originally maple, but this oak seat plank is held in with framing nails. While the original leg spindles were maple, this back left leg is oak, wider than the other three. With the different types of wood, the poorly glued seat, the saw marks, the damaged spindles and seat, I don't think it's worth a complete knockdown and rebuild. I mean, I'd still like my new granddaughter to enjoy it like my daughter did, so I'll fix the bad repairs, fill in the cuts and cracks, sand the crap out of it, and wrap it all up with an antique white finish in the end. It'll be a scary job, but perfect for a Halloween project. Beautiful, you're hired. Ray Stance, Pete Venkman. I'll start by removing the brad nails that pin the backrest to the spindles. They sit above the wood surface and are relatively pointy as if they were snipped off rather than countersunk with a nail punch. I'll use a 5mm leather hole punch to dig into the wood a little bit around the nail and then carve out the surrounding wood to try to get a grip on the headless nail to pull them out. This nail hunter tool is pretty helpful in lifting the rusty brads out of that hardwood. These pliers have a curved bottom allowing you to rock the nail out a little more gently, minimizing tool damage to the spindle. I got this from Lee Valley Tools. They're not a sponsor, but they're a good supplier for specialty tools like this. I wanted to do some sanding to the seat back tenon before attempting to glue it back in. I thought I might have to work a bit to knock the spindle free, but those rusty brads seem to be the only thing really holding the top of this rocker together. The entire seat back lifted up and away from the back spindles without even a whimper. My goal really wasn't to knock the entire glued structure apart, but there you go. The best laid plans of mice and monsters, I guess. At least it was easier to work on, separated from the chair and locked into the bench vise. Here, I could get some better leverage against the wood and do some shaping and smoothing with the wood rasp and rounded files. This Frankenstein patch job would still be visible with regular transparent wood finishes, so a paint job is definitely required to hide all these repairs. Frankenstein benefited from some similar window dressing too, provided you couldn't really see what was underneath. With the seat back off, it was easier to do all the finish sanding early with the piece laying on the table. So I gave it the standard 120 to 220 grit progressive sanding to get the pronounced wood grain back to level. And after a relatively busy afternoon, I thought it might be time for a beverage break. Gee, I hope this expired pumpkin ale from 2020 is still good. To reattach and glue the seat back, I'm going to use a boat building trick, which would normally start with epoxy, but in this case using Tight Bond 3 as the glue base, along with some powdered wood flour as a thickener. Mixing in enough of the flour, I'm looking for the consistency of runny peanut butter, and that provides all the bonding I need, with the added thickness to fill in any voids inside the mortise. The wood fibers also add some strength to the dry glue and provide a better foundation for sanding. The same mixture was applied to the seat back spindles and the entire assembly was clamped to pull the pieces tightly together. A little extra wipe down was needed with a damp rag to clean up the glue squeeze out around the spindles, but otherwise all it needed to do was sit undisturbed until the next day. Now that the back assembly was dry and tight, I needed to fill in the holes I made in order to remove those brad nails. I'll start with using a quarter inch Forstner bit to start a smooth hole and minimize tear out on the spindle. Then I'll finish the dowel hole with a standard drill bit. My hole is just deep enough to pass through the spindle and the oak back and into the front side of the spindle without going through. A leftover quarter inch walnut dowel will be scary strong and easy enough to sand flush with the surface. No more sharp edged nails on my granddaughter's new chair, thank you. Wiping off that excess glue, I can trim the dowels back with a flush cut saw, and I'm ready to move on to the main spindle repair. Groovy.
The two main back spindles are loose and needed to be re-glued, but again, I wasn't looking to knock all the spindle parts loose for a ground-up rebuild. Before trying to work on the bottom of the seat, I had to find a way to clamp the chair down on the work table, and this deep C-clamp seems to work once I figured out how to get it inside the chair frame. Next, I started to chip out the old wood wedges on each end of the spindle since they weren't like actually holding the chair back in place anymore. A quarter inch chisel got the party started, but an extended length thin drill bit did a better job getting down into the channel and plowing out that old wedge. The long drill bit came in handy so that I could get a vertical working angle to each spindle, even though I had to work around the bottom frame of the chair. A regular drill bit setup wouldn't work here, and Frank seems to approve. I'll need some new wedge shims for the back spindles, and this leftover block of mahogany is a good donor. This cut was 3 degrees off center and gave me a couple of solid wedges to work with. Before gluing in those wedges, I wanted to re-glue the outside of the spindle shaft first, so I gave myself some working room by knocking the spindles down about a half an inch. For the outside of the spindle shaft, I'll use some medium-thick CA glue on the walls around the spindle and then knock them back into the seat. Spraying a little CA activator will lock the spindle in place. I don't know about my uncle, but my aunt seems to approve. The split channel in the spindles would be filled in by the new wedges, and I'll go back to using tight bond wood glue for securing those shims. A liberal amount of glue was applied, and the wedges were hammered back to lock the spindles down. After a little cleanup, I don't expect the chair back to ever be a problem again. The seat required the most attention, starting with these framing nail holes. A couple of the holes are pretty deep, requiring a fair amount of gouging and handwork, but I had some trouble finding a way to hold the chair firmly on the table so that I could do the work. Yes, an extra pair of hands would be helpful here. I am Frau Blucher. Uh, maybe a foot would be better. My old trusty foot clamp seemed to be a decent choice for holding the side of the chair down on the table, and I can then use some leverage while I dig out the crud in those holes. I used a couple of different tools here. A hammer and a punch got things started, and then I had this dental pick with a curved end that seemed to work pretty well for digging into the edges of the hole and pulling out whatever bondo or wood filler was stuck in there. I also pulled out a larger diameter punch and tried to set the nails deeper in each hole before moving on to fill them in. It would be another repair that would remain visible with a wood stain and a lacquer finish, so we're back to paint as the best finish option for this project. Removing my trusty foot clamp, I could move on to the top of the seat where some hand plane work was required to fix an uneven seam on two of the planks. It didn't take much to bring the left outer edge of the seat back to level. The front of the chair had a different problem with a nice gouge right on the front edge of the seat. Whoever tried to finish this chair the last time didn't even bother to sand out or fill in the damage. They just laid a finish over the top of the tear out. I knew I wanted to fill the front contour of the seat back in, but I'll rasp out some clean wood surfaces there first to better accept whatever bonding filler I chose to use. And epoxy seems to be the right choice for this particular repair. With some blue painter's tape to create a front edge, I'll mix up some epoxy with wood flour to thicken it a bit and then get a nice blob into the front gouge using a toothpick to help get it down into the tiny little cracks and crevices. I'll also use more tape to help keep the epoxy from running out of the repair until it hardens. The mixture is also thick enough to mostly stay in place on those side nail holes, but I'll add a small piece of painter's tape over the hole to keep it in place. The tape also helps to smooth out the finish against the seat a bit. The next day I could remove the tape to find that the repairs were good, but would still of course require a buttload of sanding. I had to create a couple of specialty sanding tools from glued tongue depressors and sandpaper, and that was really the only way to get in between all those spindles. Flexible sanding sponges were also a big help getting around all the curves, and the orbital sander was best for all the flatter surfaces. Again, I started with 120 paper and finished with 220 grit on all of those surfaces. I didn't record much of the sanding effort, but sanding always takes longer than you plan. For the paint, I took a risk and tried something new at least new to me, with Krylon Fusion Spray. It's a product that mixes primer and paint, and the coverage is actually pretty good. The surface was prepped with one last acetone wipe down, and the painting began. It casts a fairly wide spray at good pressure, so the spray head needs to be 12 inches away from the surface, or it will just puddle and drip. 
because this chair had a lot of skinny spindles and parts, the paint didn't go as far as if I was painting a wide, flat surface. So it took a full can to provide a single coat. Most of the spray gets wasted in between all those chair parts, and that's not the fault of the paint. The finish seems hard, and the satin sheen will be perfect for the antiquing step that'll be next. I'll let the paint dry and harden for another full day. The antiquing step requires a medium brown tone wood stain to be wiped over the top of the white paint. I get different results in this technique depending on the type of base coat paint I use as well as the brand of stain used. But this Minwax oil based stain seemed to tint the paint pretty quickly, meaning I needed to wipe it off quickly too. When finished, the transition went from a bright white to a slightly more aged coating on the chair. The final step in the finish is to lock in the stain tinting with a top coat of clear acrylic spray. I used the same brand of product as was used for the white paint, so I felt confident that the two finishes would bond well. I applied three more light coats here. So show me already. It's showtime. In the end, the antique finish looks pretty great. Doesn't look brand new or store-bought at all. It looks like the chair has been in the family for decades, only now it's fixed and ready for grandchildren and even great-grandchildren. And while my new granddaughter is still a tiny little thing, cute as cute should be, the new chair will be waiting for her when she's ready to toddle over and climb in. There's even a cuddly soft toy waiting for her too. She's always welcome, and despite this video, we're really not all that scary.